Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 314, featuring the second installment of my interview with Mr. Jordan Weissman of Hairbrain Schemes. This part of the interview, we focus in on the history of uh, Jordan himself, his biography, I guess, uh, what got him into game designing, the early days at FASA, and then we uh, talk more about Battletech, the origins, the influences, and uh, what he thinks about the uh, computer game versions of it, including uh, MechWarrior Online. So, a lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Jordan Weissman. Okay, so Jordan, I was reading uh, some some earlier interviews with you, and uh, there was a story about how you had really had a struggle in, in school uh -huh. uh, that, with dyslexia, and it was hard to for you to read. Uh, but the, uh, Dungeons and Dungeons and Dragons saved you, <laughs> you know. I guess yeah. from a life of illiteracy, uh, illiteracy almost. Uh, you know, is that it sounds like that's the truth. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if I would have stayed illiterate my whole life, but I was illiterate as of, you know, age 16 when, when I encountered it. Um, uh, you know, I went to a good, I went to a good grade school. Um, and, uh, and the whole kind of uh, recognition of what dyslexia was, um, was a very new thing um, in, the, uh, in the early 60s. Um, and I was very lucky that my teacher was uh, one of the, she had gone to a seminar about uh, dyslexia. And, uh, and so then in second grade, rather than just thinking I was, you know, kind of not very smart, uh, she came to, she started to suspect that I might, I might, uh, actually be suffering from this. Um, and so I got into a very early tutoring program, um, uh, to learn to read. Uh, and that took many years and I, I had, um, been trained to read, but it was really hard. Um, it was, you know, it was almost mentally painful to do it. And if you're a kid, um, you know, you, you tend not to do the things that don't go easy for you. Um, and cheating my way through school was easier than actually, you know, going through the pain to learn to read. Um, especially since the stuff I was being presented to read wasn't particularly interesting to me. Um, and then, uh, that's when I encountered D and D in the year it came out. And everybody talking about elves and dwarves and trolls and uh, what, you know, uh, you know, none of those movies were around yet. <laughs> so the only way to learn that stuff was to go read it. So uh, Tolkien and D and D was my C, C Dick and Jane run. And you know, by the time I was done with those, I was actually reading pretty good. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, it there's is no no hyperbole at all to say that that D and D completely changed my life. I mean, uh, not only did it, uh, you know, inspire me that, uh, of how important reading was and reading has become a joy in my whole life, but, but it inspired me for what I was going to do for my whole life. Um, and so, yeah, I've, uh, I've, I was lucky enough to, to be able to, uh, to say thank you many times to both Dave and Gary, uh, over the course of, of working, uh, getting to know them well over many years and working with them both, uh, because yeah, I'm, I like many, I like many people, um, you know, that, that game changed my life. So you started off in college or I guess I'm studying to be a merchant Marine or part of the merchant Marine. I was what, what drew you to that? And also has that, has that influenced uh, your games in any way? Um, yes, it did actually. Um, so, uh, I love sailing. Um, and, uh, uh, my, my, if you don't read through most of high school, your grades in high school, you know, via cheating are really, you know, nothing to write home about. Um, so I wasn't graduating high school with particularly good grades. Um, and I'm not a particularly good test taker. So my SATs were, you know, okay, not great. Um, so I didn't, um, uh, and financially, you know, we didn't have a, a, a whole bunch of money to throw at, at college. Uh, my sister is a much better student than I was. And so we were thinking, well, oh, let's keep some of the powder dry for her. Um, so I didn't have that many college options and then I learned about the Merchant Marine Academy and I love sailing and the idea of someone paying me to sail around the world all the time sounded great. Um, uh, you have, it, the, the Merchant Marine Academy is like West Point or Annapolis or Kings Point. Uh, it's actually called Kings Point, but, uh, it's like West Point or Annapolis where you have to get a congressional appointment, um, uh, to go to the school. 
Um, and uh, if you live on like the West Coast or the East Coast, those are really hard to get because um, those are environments where kind of that uh, academy and and being uh, a member of the Merchant Marine is, is much more on people's mind than in the Midwest where we have a lot of dry land. Um, I lived on Lake, Lake um, uh, Michigan, so or near Lake Michigan, so we, that's where we were sail. But uh, so I was able to get the appointment because it wasn't too hotly contested in Illinois, <clears throat> um, and uh, and went there. And it was um, it was kind of part two of of, uh, of setting my life direction. I mean, D and D was really part one, and then at the academy, um, uh, one you know. It's a military academy. You learn a lot about discipline and you learn um, a lot about yourself in that process, um, which I thought was very useful. Um, and then um, uh, they also gave us a tour of a bridge simulator. This was 19, this was 1970, uh, let's see, it would have been 78, 79, something like that. Um, and this was a, a computer graphic supported bridge simulator of a ship um, very early it cost 50 million dollars to make um, uh, and it was for training uh, pilots uh, the pilot uh, the name pilot is 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 the person who comes onto a ship to drive a ship into a port where it's busy normal sea captains don't do that they bring a specialty person in to do that and they're called pilots um, and it's a very dangerous thing to train people on because you get it wrong and bridges go down or ships collide or piers get you know destroyed so they built this simulator to help train uh, pilots. We were never allowed to use it, but we just toured it. And that, you know, half an hour tour through that thing was the second part of it going, okay, yeah, that's what I'm doing for my life. I'm going to take, you know, at this point I was playing Traveler. I'm going to take Traveler and I'm going to build something like this and we're going to play Traveler in something like this, right? That was like what my 18 year old self decided, you know, needed to happen. Um, so like any rational person, I immediately quit school, went home and decided I was going to build that. Um, uh, not, a, you know, I, I had been writing, uh, code for several years at that point. Um, but, uh, for what, two, three years at that point, but, uh, um, you know, didn't know squat about electronics, which I learned very quickly when I, you know, um, went home and tried to, uh, create a network between multiple Apple IIs. Um, there was no such thing as a network card. It didn't exist. And so I, the only way we could figure out how to connect them was to serially connect the motherboards, which is a really good way to fry motherboards, uh, which we, we fried a couple of Apple IIs in, the, in, our, in our attempt. Um, and so, yeah, that, uh, I came up with this whole design of how to, how to build this thing and went out and tried to uh, raise funds uh, to do that. And everybody was like, I, you're crazy. <laughs> I mean, no one understood anything I was talking about. The idea of a multiplayer game, of a, a 3D environment that would be explored by, you know, by a team of people and building this bridge simulator. And we'd open these things like movie theaters and people would buy tickets to them. And it was, yeah, no, was, no one was going anywhere near that. So, um, so I said, all right, well, I'll, uh, I'll start a, a paper game company um, and uh, get rich overnight. And then, uh, use those that money to uh, to build um, this bridge simulator, um, and uh, and so I started FASA. Um, the uh, and, and the skill I started FASA with, I learned at the academy, which was drafting. Um, uh, FASA started by offering um, uh, uh, Starship blueprints for use with Traveler, uh, and I drew them all by hand. You know, from from what I learned in drafting classes. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, overnight didn't happen overnight, but about seven years later, the FASA had grown to a point where we could start to invest in, um, building, uh, what became known as virtual world entertainment, um, and, uh, opening the first Battletech center in, uh, the end of 1989, which indeed offered the world's, uh, first publicly available 3d environments and, uh, multiplayer, multiplayer games. I was wondering about those. Are those still available somewhere? Can you still go and, and see those? Um, uh, yeah, not the, the very first generations. The first two generations are like they're gone many, many years all into the eons. But the third generation, the Tesla uh, era cockpits, uh, are still in, in circulation. Um, uh, uh, the, the, I see them every year at Gen Con. They bring like 12 of them to Gen Con and it's incredibly cool to, to see them all up and running still. Uh, so they, there are still pot, you know, groups of them out. There was a place in Seattle until it closed just recently, but they had eight pods. 
uh, as well. So they're 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 out there uh, floating around still. You ever wanted to build a real mech? Um, everyone, no, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the things people always, you know, like when people will get into like really in-depth arguments with me about the reality of some part of, of the mech uh, stuff that I, I came up with or or Steve Peterson or other people who contributed to uh, to the engineering of mechs and they'll, you know, people will be like debating, well, this this part isn't real. I'm like, okay, look it. It's a fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to make it as realistic as possible and, and so it had that plausible. But there's there's this one underlying concept which – which actually makes all mechs not real, and it's called surface tension. Right, um, uh, the ground only holds so much weight per square inch, and mechs dramatically exceed the weight per square inch that pretty much any surface on Earth will hold. So every time they took a step, they would just like sink into the ground. Um, uh, there's actually uh, an interesting. Um, uh, historical precedents for this with the German tank, the uh, I think it was called the Maus, um, uh, where they built this incredibly armored, huge tank, and um, they had been, you know, all of its early testing was on, you know, on this uh, steel reinforced uh, concrete, um, uh, you know, kind of a test environment, and then they rolled it off into the field, and it sank uh, into the ground. <laughs> so it was like. Oh yeah! Oops. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a, it is a fantasy, but it's a wonderful fantasy and one that we you know one that we love to take and make as realistic uh, and, uh, as possible so that we can enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, so you you mentioned that you had started off making uh, these traveler uh, traveler products. What was it about traveler? Well, okay, meet three in why is Jordan Jordan you know, was, uh, one was D and D two was that simulator at the Academy and beat three, uh, actually no beat three happened before that. So, uh, so beat one was D and D beat two was actually star Wars. Okay. And beat three was the simulator. Um, and so why traveler? Because I could take traveler and make a star Wars game with it, <laughs> which is what I did. I mean, the campaign I ran was, was basically star Wars. Right. Um, and, uh, and I was just, you know, like most of my generation, that movie was, you know, part of rewiring our brains yet again um, into a, into looking at, a, a, you know, at um, world building and science fiction in a, in a very different way. Um, and so, yeah, I was totally swept away with that. I noticed you did get to make a, a Star Trek role playing game. I guess that was what, 1983? Yeah. That must have been a heck, um, of a heck of a great licensing deal for you guys. Well, it was interesting because I uh, uh, went to Paramount um, and the head of licensing there um, was basically why what, no one wants Star Trek anymore because it had been right after the Star Trek movie because after Star Wars did so well, right, Paramount went out and did, did a Star Trek movie um, and um, it did not do well. <laughs> uh, and so um, I, it was kind of uh, it was kind of a, um, a, uh, a tarnished property at the, at the time, you know. Um, but I was like, I, you know, there's huge loyal fans and, um, you know, I think if we stick with kind of the television show era, which is what all of our product did, uh, um, initially until, until next generation came along. Um, uh, I think, you know, I think it's a place we'd love to explore. And so, um, uh, it wasn't so much about, it was actually her understanding what the genre was because they had never heard of role-playing games and, and licensing to create role-playing games was a, you know, that took a whole bunch of explanation. Uh, but once we got past that, um, it was a very good relationship with them. And and we uh, we created a, a huge amount of uh, content for the Star Trek universe. Um, uh, and a lot of content which they went on to go use. I mean, a lot, like a lot, all the all of the Klingon politics and the uh, explanation of the different types of Klingons and thought admirals and all of that stuff was in FASA product uh, before it was in television shows. Um, and the television shows were, you know, then then took the source material we had created and built on that. Um, a lot of the ship designs that we did were then later seen on screens, you know, in the in the uh, subsequent television shows, uh, which was very cool. Um, and also made me realize I, I, we should be focusing on making our own world <laughs> rather than only adding to other people's. Um, but it was it was very cool uh, and really enjoyed working in the in the uh, in the Star Star Trek universe. 
1984, that's when we get the first Battletech uh, tabletop role-playing game, right? And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the inspirations for that. And uh, it was what, it 80, 84, right? Oh, yeah. did I say 90? I mean, yeah, 1984. I don't know what I said. Uh, <laughs> anyway, 1984. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the inspirations uh, behind the game and uh, what you think set it apart from the other games on the market at that time. Uh, sure. Uh, well, the inspiration was was pretty easy. I was at a, um, a hobby trade show, and um, uh, there was a, a guy who was importing model kits from Japan, and he had a ton of these small scale um, uh, uh, model kits from uh, Southern Cross and Make Cross and uh, uh, Crusher Joe, and they were just like they've been dumped on the market because they just the shows had ended and and you know they were just way over production and so he had a whole bunch of them to sell so uh i just loved the look of those things i thought they were you know very cool looking um uh and wanted to you know kind of take that military sense of the machinery and take it to kind of a logical kind of a western logical extension right in the in the japanese version of of uh, crusher joe and dogram uh, not dogram dogram didn't exist yet um, but um, Mech Cross and Southern Cross, um, you know, the, the, the Mecca had kind of a mystical component. And I wanted to treat them more like, uh, you know, kind of World War II tanks that walked, you know. Um, and that our, the personality was that they had was like the personality that a fighter pilot imbues upon his or her plane, um, you know, as opposed to it really having a, a personality, you know. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, reached out to the model companies in Japan and got a license to use the, the imagery in the game. And, and that's where battle droids, uh, came from. Um, and it, the first edition of battle droids included model kits, uh, in the game. Um, uh, and then we went on to say we had, uh, additional boxes of model kits to, to, uh, to buy, um, to expand the game. Uh, so that that that's where it came from. Why why did I think? Why do I think it, it touched a note? Well, I think other people reacted to the imagery, um, uh, like I did. I think uh, the imagery is just so strong. Um, but I think the other thing that really differentiated the game is that the game itself kind of kind of sit in a middle ground between being a a tactical board game and a role playing game, because it had all this fiction woven into the actual rule book um, uh, so that right from the beginning you were in a much more a much deeper richer fictional universe even though it was a, a, the mechanics were of a board game the kind of way it was presented was presented like a role playing game uh, and I think that that world kind of you know grab people and immerse themselves in it and and then the way we unroll we, we rolled out additional expansions again kept developing characters and stories and plot lines uh, and then we started the novel series, which really allowed you to dive in deeper to the world. And I, I think it was a combination of, you know, the gameplay, the imagery, and the world um, just kind of connected with people. I noticed you called it Battle Droids. Uh, is it true that, I was reading on Wikipedia about that, and they said that George Lucas, I guess, objected to you calling it that? And... Well, I don't know if it was George himself, um, uh, but uh, lawyers on, on uh, Lucasfilm's behalf contacted us and, and said, you know, uh, Droid is a is a trademark of, of ours and you can't use battle droids. And I sent him a copy of Isaac Asimov's books and said, you know, been around <laughs> a long time. Um, but they have a lot of lawyers and they're a big company and we're a little company without a lot of lawyers. And we were actually in the process of negotiating with them um, for a, uh, for potentially doing uh, Star Wars games at the time. So uh, I was like, well, sometimes, you know, um, a, a tactical surrender is the, is the best point. And, uh, and so we stepped back and moved from battle droids to battle tech. Um, and then, you know, many years later, they actually came out in star Wars with battle droids. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, that's, it did the first, I think it was roughly 5,000 copies were, were called battle droids. I got to admit, I like battle tech better than, <laughs> you know, I do too. Uh, I really, I, I know that's part of the reason also I was, you know, kind of like, all right, let's surrender. Cause I actually, we came up with, um, uh, um, battle, battle tech. And I was, I was, uh, actually became happier with that as well, you know, and, and the way that the kind of whole thing worked with battle mech to battle tech. And, and we, we really kind of started to create a more cohesive expression of the thing. So. What are your thoughts on these computer games that, that came out in the 
in the uh, late '80s. The Crest, we've already mentioned the Crescent Hawks, Inception, but uh, Mech Warrior. Um. So, uh, I look. I you know I was overjoyed to to be um, uh, able to work with the teams a little bit on those. I mean. Uh, uh, I wasn't designing them, but uh, but was you know in terms of being able to uh, co you know collaborate with them on, and um, I mean Chris Earhart who was the producer on the uh, Crescent Hawks and Crescent Hawks uh, um, Revenge, I, I just thought he did a great job. Um, I think they really captured a lot of uh, the universe and the and the the story. Um, uh, the tactical combat was was solid and not overwhelming. Um, you know, it's pretty simple platform if we look backwards. I mean, you know, the, the computers weren't capable of that much, but I thought he did a fantastic job of capturing that. Um, MechWarrior 1, um, uh, I don't think he really worked that well, um, but we had been working in the cockpits for, for doing, you know, all the Battletech centers and the Birch World centers, and then when they started on MechWarrior 2, we were able to, you know, kind of collaborate more with them on that. And uh, MechWarrior 2 was a long and tough development, um, but, you know, the results were I thought spectacular. Um, you know, it really brought, uh, you know, uh, certainly what we were able to do in the cockpits was much higher because we had custom machines, but being able to bring what they had brought to um, PCs was was fantastic, you know. Um, and I think it's still, I was reading an LA Times article last year, I think it's still Activision's highest unit seller ever. Um, you know, I don't, not in gross dollars anymore, but in terms of actual number of units, I think it's still, you know, way up there for them. Um, and it, it doubled or tripled the size of Activision. So they were very happy with it as well. Uh, so what are your thoughts on uh, Mech Warrior Online? You know, that came out in what, September 2013. Uh -huh. I was looking at the reviews and they seem kind of, uh, I mean, some people really like it, but there's also some criticisms. It's, I mean, what are your thoughts on it? Well, Russ and um, Brian, uh, the the founders of, uh, of Piranha, um, are, uh, are just like the most sincere Battletech fans uh, around. I mean, they really love the game. They grew up playing it. It's uh, uh, they know it inside and out. And they, I know, you know, for you know, for people who um, who like and, and some people who really like the decisions they made. Other people disagree with the decisions they made. But I think the one thing I can say for sure is I know that they're um, they are uh, and always always wanted to do the right thing for the game and for the audience. I mean, they really uh, they. This is a universe that means a lot to them, um, and it took them, a, you know, several years to get this game made. Um, this was not kind of like some quickie kind of target of opportunity. Um, they worked hard um, for a long time to be able to raise the money and uh, and put this game put this game together. Um, you know, I think it's it's a very hardcore sim. You know, um, uh, I think more so than you know than we saw. Certainly, I, you know, the Mech Warrior Two. Um, and, the, uh, and then the uh, Mech Warrior 3 were pretty hardcore sims, and then they kind of like 4 and so on started to slide more arcadey. Uh, this, I think, you know, it goes back to where those were and probably even further um, in terms of, you know, kind of its, uh, uh, the depth of its, of its simulation. Um, so, and I think it's, it's beautiful. Running, you know, running online games is hard. Um, you know, it's a, it's a real-time audience, and, and they're, I think they got, um, uh, had, you know, some real problems with the publisher uh, that they had hooked up with to help finish funding the game um, that really kind of uh, it created some issues between them and their audience, which I think they've, they've been working hard to, uh, to recover from. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with a new retrospective. I'll keep the title uh, under wraps, though, so you can be surprised. Uh, hopefully, it'll be something that you enjoy, though. Uh, as always, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your support of the show. really means a lot to me, guys, so thank you very much if you have uh, already supported the show. Uh, if you haven't already and would like to, just go to that link in the show notes uh, called Patreon. It only takes a couple of minutes, and it's a lot of fun. And I know you will appreciate the show even more if you support it uh, financially. So uh, thanks to everyone who has done so. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, uh, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Uh, 
I uh, got some really cool items this week. Uh, one is, uh, I'm going to go ahead and read this one first. This is from Adam uh, of Fragments of Silicon, uh, Fragments of Silicon podcast. And uh, he sent this in about Paradox. That's the company that did the uh, Crusader Kings line of games. Apparently they have Bolt White Wolf. And that's the company that owns the uh, Vampire the Masquerade and World of Darkness. And the idea seems to be that they will be releasing some new uh, computer games. Uh, I saw something about a Crusader Kings with vampires uh, as a possibility. So anyway, it'd be interesting to see what they do with all of that, uh, what do they call that, uh, that, that universe, I guess. Uh, another bit of news, uh, pretty cool. Uh, GOG, goodoldgames.com, has now released... Uh, the Ravenloft, Dark Sun, and the Kryn series of role-playing games. I'll put a link to that, my affiliate link there in the show notes. Uh, so please use that if you want to buy this, pick up this package in the show, get a little kickback uh, at no extra cost to you. Uh, I'm not really familiar with the Ravenloft or Dark Sun, even though I think I, think I, have, a, I have them all. Uh, but the Kryn series, I really love those. If you like those Dragonlance novels, uh, the games are pretty much a must. So I head over there and pick that up. And then uh, finally, I don't know when you'll be watching this. Uh, it's actually Halloween right now, so I'm trying to kind of rush this because I think the, I, might, I might start getting some kids uh, knocking, uh, some trick-or-treaters knocking on the door here in a few minutes. So uh, I want to get, I want to be there with a candy bucket uh, for them. So we'll cut this a little bit shorter than usual. Uh, let's see, I did have some other news here. Oh, <laughs> duh. Uh, so anyway, there's three days left on the Battletech Kickstarter. So I hope you guys watch this soon. And because uh, they're almost to their a really important stretch goal. They're at 2.2 million, and they need if they have 2.5 million, uh, then they'll do a PvP multiplayer uh, version or uh, functionality, whatever you want to call it. So I thought I'd throw that out there. They're almost there, just another 0.3 million, <laughs> 300 was it 300 thousand dollars, I guess, and you'd have PvP uh, multiplayer. So pretty cool. All right, I think that will do it for the news. Uh, now, what about that ale of the week? Uh, this week, I have something truly extraordinary. Uh, it was kind of fun. I was there at my usual uh, liquor store, and the, the guy knows me pretty well because I come in there all the time. He's like, Matt, come back, come to the uh, back with me. <laughs> I'm like, damn, what's, go what's going on here? Felt like I was uh, I'm, you know, about to get offered some drugs or something. Uh, but then he, he brings open this box, and there's this... Uh, a couple of these uh, Surly Darkness Russian Imperial Stouts in there. Apparently this is a very, very rare or a bit limited release. So he actually didn't want to sell these just to anybody, uh, to, only to his uh, most loyal customers, I guess. So I was kind of flattered by that, that he would uh, put one of these aside for me. Uh, but the label here is just absolutely wicked evil. <laughs> Perfect for Halloween. I mean, this thing is... Dumb. I don't usually save the bottles, you know, but... I think I'll make an exception in this case because it's just such a cool print on there. Uh, art by Brandon Holt, just totally awesome. Uh, and, you know, by the way, this is a Surly Brewing Company out of Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. It's got the sort of waxy top on it like a maker's mark. Let's see, our 2015 vintage bottling of darkness features a screeching bat nightmare by local artist Brandon Holt. Uh, no creature is more adept at navigating in the darkness than a bat. Possibly with the exception of a rat. I'll just throw that in there. Uh, emerging from a deep and ancient cave, this year's twisted nocturnal creature has evolved a set of adaptations well suited to detecting and devouring uncommon nourishment. Notes of chocolate, coffee, dried tart cherries, and raisins emanate from his lair. <laughs> if you can evade the talons and teeth, the thick body of this Russian imperial stout finishes sweet with a piney resinous hop character. Sign Omar Ansari and Todd Hogg at surlybrewing.com. Let's see. I was wondering if they would say how much alcohol is in this. I'm not seeing a... Uh, I'm not seeing anywhere on the bottle how strong it is, but it's a little bit worrisome because usually a Russian Imperial Stout is on up there in terms of alcohol, but nope, not seeing it. I'm just going to guess, though, it's going to be pretty strong, so you want to take it easy on this. Anyway, let's get this open and see what the Surly Darkness Russian Imperial Stout is all about. All right, so I got some of the Surly uh, Darkness here in the rather excellent drinking horn. <laughs> smells really good. It smells like, like a, a sort of bourbon chocolate caramel 
uh, mixed there. It's very sweet smelling. Uh, a little bit intimidated by this. I mean, that demon on the label there is pretty frightening. I hope that's not a sign of things to come. Anyway, well, it smells really nice. I'll just give it a taste. <clears throat> that will get your attention. <laughs> uh, lots of chocolate, coffee, uh, very sweet. Uh, definitely taste them. some bourbon uh, elements there. It's uh, quite strong. It almost sort of dried out my, my throat just then when I, when I drank that little, <laughs> little taste. I'll try it again here. Ah, very flavorful, very sweet, very uh, sort of a cherry, uh, dark cherry, chocolatey coffee, those, those sorts of flavors uh, with some bourbon. I like elements. You know, repeat that. <laughs> Ooh, I think it's already starting to get to me. I kid you not. Uh, extremely strong. I don't know what the alcohol content is, but I'm guessing might be anywhere from like 12 uh, percent or even higher than that but uh really really tasty i'll try it one more time maybe it won't fall down if i try it uh, one more time uh, very very uh i guess you'd call this sweet and bitter with a lot of sort of bourbon flavors a little bit of a smoky taste all in all, quite good. I don't know if this is something I'd want to drink every day, <laughs> uh, which I guess is why they only release this in very limited quantities, but it is quite nice. Uh, I'm going to go, uh, you know what, I'm going to go a full five out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, it's not for everybody, uh, something like this. It's a Russian Imperial Stout. It's very dark, very uh, uh, heavy on the flavor. Uh, so it's not for everybody, but if you enjoy this sort of thing, I think you can't go wrong with this, uh, assuming you can find it. And it's worth looking out just to get that awesome uh, bottle with the original art on it. It's very, really cool. Uh, so anyway, uh, five out of five drinking horns for the uh, Darkness Russian Imperial Stout from Surly. So let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I found a pretty cool quote on one of the Battletech cards from the collectible card game, uh, Commander Kara. And it goes something like this. So there I was, between a rock and a hard place, when suddenly I thought, why am I on this side of the rock? <laughs> See you guys next week.